الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Last time we met we spoke about the second fiqhi rule القاعدة الفقهية number two which is Certainty is not removed by doubt. Al-yaqeen la yazulu bil-shak. And this is a very important rule, and it's also logical. And we discussed where we got this rule from the Quran and from the Sunnah. And also, we have stated that there are a number of sub-rules that we can learn from this. And I said, if you remember that, the scholars of usul al-fiqh, the fundamentals of fiqh, came with something called in Arabic al-istushab, which is to give a ruling to something that the Quran and Sunnah has either proven or did not mention. So the ruling remains as it is. And there are a number of rulings that can be understood from this. For example, this istishab is taken from a logical rule, which is baqa'u makan ala makan, meaning everything remains as it is. What does that mean? If someone says, I have a problem, I am married, but I think I divorced my wife. We say, okay, are you certain? He says, no. I say, apply the rule. He said, what rule? Things remain as they were. So, did you marry? He said, yes, this is my marriage contract. Okay, do you have something that invalidates this marriage contract? Did you divorce your wife? He said, I'm not sure. He said, in this case, the marriage contract remains as it is. It remains as it was, and it will remain as it is until we have certainty. This is called al-istishab because we don't have any evidence to remove this from marriage to divorce or to separation or to khul'a. Then we leave it remaining as it is. Are there any other rules that can be stemmed from this sub-rule, which is baqa'u makan ala makan, to remain as it was? Do we have certain facts or rules that we can apply? Scholars say yes. For example, what is the default when it comes to food in general? Allah Azza wa Jal tells us in the Quran that Ya ayyuhal nas, kulu mimma fil ardi halalan tayyiba. O people, eat from whatever is on earth. This is halal, this is good for you. So one comes to me and says, Shaykh, what is the ruling on eating papaya? Or what's the ruling on eating oranges that are not yellow, but they are pink in color? I tell him, it's halal. He said, bring me your evidence. I said, the evidence is the rule. Everything is halal until proven otherwise. Allah says, O oh, people, eat from whatever on the earth. So this is in general, in food. Okay, Sheikh, what is the ruling in meat to be specific? He said, no, meat is different. Why? Apple is not different. Oranges are not different. Green Plants are not different. Why when it comes to meat? I said, ah, because in meat, when slaughtering it, we have to say, Bismillah. Allah says, do not eat what the name of Allah was not mentioned over. This means that anything that the name of Allah is not mentioned over, it is not halal for us. And also the Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, whatever sheds the blood and the name of Allah is mentioned, eat. So I have to be sure and certain that this animal was slaughtered and the name of Allah was mentioned. And Allah says, do not eat from what the name of Allah was not mentioned. So if I go to a shop in a country and I find meat and this country, I do not know whether they slaughter or not, whether they say Bismillah or not. And this country is not 
Christian, not Jewish, and not Muslim. It is a country of Buddhist. It's a country of Hindus. It's a country of atheists. No religion at all. So do I eat or not? The default is all meat is haram. So I do not eat. And now, this is very difficult, Sheikh. I go to study in Japan for a year. You're telling me not to eat anything that is meat? I said, yes, because they're not Christian, they're not Jewish, and they're not Muslim. And I cannot eat except what these three people slaughter with the conditions. But if I go to a Christian country, we know that in chapter 5, Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah tells us that the slaughtering of the people of the book is halal for us. So when I go to a Christian country, can I eat from the meat or I have to ask, first of all, did you slaughter or not? There are two situations. If I know for certain that this country do not slaughter and they forbid slaughtering. Example, I think it is in Belgium and in Holland that it is totally against the law to slaughter. You have to first kill the animal. After the animal is dead, you slaughter it. If I know that this is a law and it is implemented in that country, this means that I cannot eat the meat there at all. It is haram. But if they do not have such a law, and there are places that slaughter, and there are places that stun the animal, then slaughter, but they're Christian country, if this is the case, then it is not needed for me to ask. I just go and eat, say bismillah, and eat. What is the evidence? The evidence is that the Prophet ﷺ was invited by a Jewish woman and she cooked for him a sheep and she stuffed it with poison. She wanted to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ answered the invitation and ate from that sheep. He did not ask her, did you slaughter it or not? Which means that the people of the book, we don't investigate. We do not have to investigate. So if you go back to the original rule, the rule says that the meat of animals is haram until proven otherwise, except when it comes to Muslim, Christian, or Jewish. This means that if I go to your home, if you invite me one day, I don't know if you will, but if you invite me one day and you present me with chicken or with beef or with mutton and say bismillah sheikh eat it is extremely wrong for me to say is this halal or not this is forbidden you're a muslim i eat without asking also if you're a christian or a jew i eat without asking except if i wanted to make sure that this is not pork because i know that you eat pork and i have doubt i ask is this pork or not he says no i eat i say bismillah and I eat. So this is the default when it comes to meat. There are a lot of evidences to back this up. For example, the Prophet ﷺ, one of the evidences, that his companions asked him, we have neighbors and we get gifts from them that is meat. We don't know whether they said Bismillah or not. The Prophet told them ﷺ, you say Bismillah and eat. Of course, this is not from a non-Muslim other than the Jew or Christian. This is from recently reverted to Islam people. But they slaughter, we don't know they say Bismillah or not. So it shows that if you do not know and if the meat comes to you from a Muslim, a Christian or a Jew, you can say Bismillah and eat unless you are certain that they did not slaughter. In this case, it is haram completely for you to consume that meat. So this rule is known as al-istishab. Where did we get it from? We got it from a collection of evidences and we got it from the fiqhi rule that things stay as they are. The default things, everything is halal. Default. Everything is pure. Default. When it comes to specifics such as meat, no, everything is haram.
So it remains as it is. Is there anything else that shares the same ruling? We will come to discuss this, inshallah, after the break. So stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. So we spoke about the default in meat. And it has to be slaughtered, that it has to be mentioned the name of Allah. And the default, it is all prohibited, unless proven otherwise. Now, this does not, of course, include seafood, because seafood is, by default, all halal. You don't have slaughtering. Whatever you find in the sea, living or dead, it's all halal. Now, moving to the second rule that they have obtained from the things remain as they are, unchanged, which is certainty is not removed by doubt. One of the sub-rules, they say that the default in human life is prohibition. What does that mean? It means that you cannot kill anyone or you cannot hit or beat or torture anyone because all human beings are prohibited for you to do such a thing. And this is very important because sometimes people may go to extremes and that is why we have extremists. They think that if you're not following my religion, this means I can kill you. And this is not found in Islam. Islam governs and controls this and it tells you no. Everyone you see is haram for you to kill. So I say, can I kill my neighbor? He's irritating me. He's always putting the volume of the music up. He's putting trash on my door. And he does bad things to me. Can I kill him? The answer is no. I said, what's the evidence? Subhanallah. The default in souls, in human life, is prohibition. This is the default. Now, is there any exceptions to the rule of course a murderer must be executed a soul for a soul and a person if he does a crime that has the punishment of execution then he should be executed as in the case for example in some countries that when you have grand treason if you go against your country and you are a spy or something they execute you what about if he is a Christian? Can I kill him? No. What kind of Christian or Jew is he? He's staying in our country. How dare you kill him? He's got a visa. He's got a contract saying that we don't have any trouble with him and he respects our laws and he has all the rights that we have as residents, as Muslims. So, mm, okay. Can I go to his country and kill him? Definitely not. You cannot enter his country without a visa. Secondly, we have treaties. We have peace accord. We're civilized. We don't kill people just like this. Okay. If there's a country that we are at war with, Muslims are against the non-Muslims. And they are at war. So what's the ruling? Well, we have to look. Because this individual might have gotten permission to visit the Muslim country for trade or for something. You cannot do anything wrong to him. So everything is governed in Islam and it has a ruling for it. And you have these fiqhi rules to control your thinking. So you're walking down the street, someone crashes your car, oh, I'm going to kill him. No, 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 wait, wait. What is the fiqhi rule? Human life is prohibited. Khalas. This is the default. You cannot do that. Of course, we can get the evidence from the Quran and from the Sunnah, but at the moment, I need something to come up with now. I don't have time to go to references. Now, this is the rule that you can learn from it. Do you have any questions? Yes, Saad. Sheikh, my question is that as this rule is everything around is pure. So, relating to money, for example, if I'm trading with a bank and they have a credit card system, I'm using that credit card and I get a voucher of 10,000 rupees to spend at a hotel of your choice. So, it's a gift from the bank. Because we know that the Prophet ﷺ, when he used to eat with the Jews, they themselves used to deal in interest. So is it halal to do such kinds of exchanging of gifts from the bank and all? Because everything around is pure. Okay, first of all, the rule, everything around us is pure, deals with purity, which requires washing. And 
purity that requires wudu. So this is the purity, the physical purity. The mental purity is not the one we are talking about. Now, to address your question, it is permissible for you to deal with the bank when it comes to transactions that do not include riba. Your credit card is riba-based. So you buy something, you do not buy it cash. You buy it on credit, meaning that the Visa or the MasterCard or the Carte Blanche or the Diners Club or the American Express, they're actually lending you money. And they're telling you, this is in the contract, that you have 40 days approximately, which they call the grace period, to return the money back. Otherwise, we will take riba, we will take interest. So the minute you buy something, this is agreement from your side that, yes, I, I know that you will take riba after 40 days, but inshallah, I will pay. This is haram by itself. Agreeing on such a transaction is haram. The only halal way to make it is if you deposit up front, say 20,000 riyals, you're going to buy something, you deposit 20,000 riyals in your credit card account, or you authorize the bank to immediately withdraw from your bank account without waiting the grace period, and you have definitely, at the time of the purchase, you have money in your bank account. But to have zero and to go buy and say, inshallah, after one week or two weeks or three weeks or 30 days, I will pay, this is not permissible. Secondly, when it comes to the issue of the bank giving you gifts, the bank giving you vouchers, now, this is a very tricky subject. If you have a bank account and the bank gives you gifts every three months, every six months, because you're an important customer, this is haram for you to take. This is riba. But if you're buying through your credit card and the bank gives you vouchers for that, this is halal. You can take that. Now, one would say, what is the difference? And I'll tell you what the difference is. When you open a bank account, is this considered to be a deposit? The money you're giving to the bank in bank account. Is it a deposit or is it a loan? And what is the difference? The difference is very important in Islam. If the bank is taking this money from you as a deposit, this means that if the bank itself was burnt to the ground, you have no right in going and saying to the bank, give me my money. This is amana. So if you give me something, you say, Sheikh, please keep the car with you as an amana. And I put it in my garage, very safe place. And one night, a thief comes, takes the car and run away. I report this to the police. You come the following morning, say, Sheikh, where is my car? It was stolen. He said, Sheikh, you have to give me a new one from your own pocket. It's your responsibility. The answer is, no, it's not my responsibility. This is an amana. I'm doing you a favor. So as long as I did not do anything wrong, there's nothing wrong on me. This is different than a loan. If I tell you, Akhi, can I borrow your car? And you say, okay, here's my car, borrow it. And I put it in my garage and a thief comes and steals your car. In the morning, I say, Wallahi, I'm sorry, the car was stolen. Is this sufficient? No, you have all the right to tell me, Wallahi, this is your problem. I lent you my car, so give it back to me or give me the equivalent. In the bank, it's the same thing. If the bank burns to the ground, they will give you your money back, which means it's not a deposit. It is not an aman, it's a loan. So this means that I am lending the bank 100,000, 1 million, depending on how much I'm depositing. Anything they give me in return, this would be considered as interest. The other way around is not, which is if I buy with my credit card. I buy from the shop worth of 10,000 reals. Now, am I borrowing from the bank? No, I am borrowing from the card itself. But the bank is benefiting. This is not riba because I'm not paying riba. So the card holder 
when he receives gifts from the bank or from the visa company or from the MasterCard company, he's actually not receiving interest because he's not lending, he's borrowing. So this is permissible and there's nothing wrong with it, but we have to come back to the origin, which is dealing with these plastics is very dangerous and puts you in haram's way. So what to do? When we travel, when we go to the market, we have to have with us these credit cards. Otherwise, it's not advisable to have so much money. Well, there is an alternative. And the alternative is that you always try to avoid credit cards and get debit cards. Debit cards are like credit cards, but the only difference is that you do not borrow. You cannot use it except after charging it or paying for it. So it's like prepaid. So you have to pay in advance 5000